Welcome back. As Canadians, we're pretty accustomed to crossing a border because most of us live within a day's drive of it. But here's something many of you may not know. America isn't the only country Canada shares a border with. We're driving the rocky and scrubby landscape four hours out of St. John's to Canada's most unique border town. Fortune, Newfoundland, a harbor of good fortune when the fishery was plentiful. But today, it's probably best known for this plain looking building, the only port of entry in North America to a territory of France. Saint-Pierre and Miquelon are tiny islands only 30 kilometers from the Newfoundland shore, a minuscule residue of the vast French empire which once dominated North America and the consolation prize for losing it all to the British in 1763. The ocean crossing only takes about 90 minutes, which is about exactly the same amount of time as it takes to cross the English Channel to mainland France. I remember the first time I came here, it was about 25 years ago, and I was really struck by how French these islands felt. So as we prepare to dock, I'm wondering whether the internet and all of the interaction with the outside world today has changed the flavor of the islands. Well, the answer at first is as thick as the fog. The islands get a lot of it in the summer, but it's possible to make out the tricolor flag of France flying in the only major town, Saint-Pierre. On a clearer day, a small French town of 6,000 is revealed hundreds of years old. A surprisingly prosperous place built on solid rock with a Catholic church at its center. The streets are European thin and quiet. The buildings have no numbers because everyone knows where everyone lives. Like many maritime towns, the color comes from the brightly painted homes and businesses. We've timed our visit to include Bastille Day. That's the national holiday in France and its territories. Charles de Gaulle Square is alive with families and kids who run free because there's so little crime in such an isolated place. The dancers salute the regions of mainland France that most of Saint-Pierre's ancestors immigrated from. Basque, Norman, and Britannique fishing towns. Visit the many bakeries early enough in the day for fresh and chewy baguettes, croissant and French pastries. And you pay for everything in euros here, not dollars. Fine French wine is a bargain by Canadian standards. There are so many to choose from and varieties that you'd never find in a North American wine store. For these visiting Canadian tourists, it is Little France. I feel it's so historic background. Like we don't have that in Alberta so much. I mean, it goes back 100 years, it's old really. But here you're going back four or 500 years. It's, it's just amazing. I, I just love the old, artifacts and the stuff that's around here. Right. Just amazing. You know, you could you could you could spit and hit Newfoundland here. Yeah. Really? <laughs> and, yeah. and and yet it's very different. How big a difference does it feel to you guys? It's uh, You're I, in I, another country. Yeah, you're in another you country. You feel like you're in another right. country. The ties between Saint Pierre and mainland France celebrated on this day are deep. A quick side trip reveals just how deep. For the past two summers, a group of archaeology students from Memorial University in Newfoundland has cleared away debris to expose the walls of an ancient building of the earliest European settlers. The dig is being supervised by their professor, Catherine Lossier. So one of the things I've discovered about Saint-Pierre is that the people cling to where their ancestors originally came from in France, Normandy, the Basque area. Are you finding examples of artifacts from that period of settlement here? 
So for the 350 years, we have artifacts that are signature from Normandy and Brittany. So what kinds of artifacts are you able to look at and say this is a representative of how the work was done, how the life was lived? So uh, with, for example, that stoneware from Normandy, we can tell that they were bringing supplies with them. So probably there were butter or other uh, food supply. We have also, uh, of course, a testimony of um, the use of firearms. So we have gun flints uh, for the 18th century periods. And here's another influence from 18th century France, the game of pétanque. It's kind of a cross between lawn bowling and curling. Two teams try to position the metal ball closest to the target in the circle. It was first played in the south of France, and the tournaments are very serious business in Saint-Pierre. When it comes to business and the economy, Saint-Pierre has endured a lot of hard times, but a few great ones. The Great Depression was a surprising boom time for Saint-Pierre. The docks were packed with wooden crates of liquor destined for the United States, which had banned it during Prohibition. Canadian law forbade selling booze directly to the Americans, so it was sold through here, technically France. The building housing this museum once belonged to the Bronfman family of Montreal who made their fortune using Saint-Pierre as the center of a clandestine whiskey trade into the U.S. 97-year-old Eugene Teo was a teenager during the bootleg boom. And what do you remember about it? Well, I remember there was lots, lots of boat, uh, lots of boat, because I live on the waterfront and my father had a store and we were liquor, we were liquor on the store. So uh, what I see, there was all the uh, liquor uh, on the wharf there. Uh, and Lots of activity? Activity, yeah. Oh, yeah. How many stores in Saint-Pierre would have liquor in them to sell? Oh, all the stores in Saint-Pierre used to sell the liquors. Every store? Yes, um, the, only the, the, the church didn't sell. <laughs> only the church didn't sell. <laughs> When Prohibition ended in 1933, Saint-Pierre's biggest boom collapsed. And the island's fishermen, who had largely given up the sea to work in liquor, took to their dories again, which sustained the families until the cod was fished out in the late 1980s. And Canada declared an enforced moratorium on the Grand Banks fishery. Saint-Pierre's economy collapsed again. And desperate men took desperate measures. That was the story which first brought me to Saint-Pierre oh so many years ago. The provocative voyage has created a public stir, but Canadian authorities... A boundary dispute had erupted between Canada and France after 17 cod fishermen from Saint-Pierre were arrested by the Canadian Coast Guard. There were also four local politicians on board who wore the tricolor slash of France to get the attention of politicians in Paris who were fighting an election campaign. And... It worked. Canada has a lot of progress to make as a civilized country. It was an unlikely diplomatic war over codfish. The French government has suddenly decided to strictly enforce an area of the ocean fishermen from both islands have always sailed in. Is this where we want to fish? Right Two here? and a half decades later, I'm heading out to the once disputed territory with Gilles Poitier, who remembers the cod war well. An international tribunal settled the codfish war in Canada's favor. So today, Saint-Pierre fishermen can only jig for cod in a sliver of the sea, 20 kilometers wide, but 350 kilometers long. Not enough to restore an industry. So this is uh, jigging the cod. Jigging the cod. Yeah. So what was it like when the moratorium happened? Because you were fishing then. Uh, it must have just devastated your, your business when the okay. moratorium happened. For people, yes, it devastated the family and everything. Every people uh, was at sea. Uh, they say, what, what we can do now, uh, what we can work. Uh, many people uh, changed the work. I was here 25 years ago, and a lot of people at Saint-Pierre were mad at Canadians. What's it like now? Oh, no, no, that's okay now. That, that, that was at that time, we say. No more fish wars? No. 
leaving home to study abroad. The school system in France isn't what they'd expect it to be. Puts an island in peril. They're going to have to bring people from France to work here. When W5 continues. The French islands of Saint-Pierre and Miquelon are usually a pretty sleepy place, but not on this day. For a repeat visitor like me, who's wondered if the passage of a quarter century has eased the island's ties to France, the World Cup soccer final is a good test. An epic championship game against Croatia, begun with a full-throated rendition of the French national anthem, the stirring Marseillaise. The bar is packed with the next generation of Saint-Pierre, many of whom spend winters in France going to school or working. Whatever split loyalties these young adults feel about spending their lives on these islands or leaving them, this is a day for celebrating the unity of the blue, white, and red. But it wasn't always one France or one St. Pierre. In a long forgotten moment in history, this isolated French territory 30 kilometers from Newfoundland suffered divided loyalties, which believe it or not, made it the target of an invasion during World War II. A quick history lesson to set the scene. When Hitler's army occupied parts of France in 1940, a new cooperating French government was installed called the Vichy regime. The Vichy rulers also controlled overseas French territories like Saint-Pierre and Miquelon. So Canada, the US and Britain became concerned that Saint-Pierre could soon be used by the German Navy as a Nazi controlled seaport on the doorstep of North America. There was also a powerful radio transmitter on Saint-Pierre, capable of relaying the position of the Canadian and British ships that were resupplying the effort to defend Britain, a critical lifeline. Eugene Theo was a young mariner working with the Allies then, and he had no doubt Germany was eyeing Saint-Pierre. And outside Saint-Pierre, there was uh, a German submarine. We know, this, we know that uh, we are... Uh, we had, we had the story about uh, after the war. He was waiting to be torpedoed that boat, but he had the call from another, another uh, submarine that it, so he left there. So there were Germans off of Saint Pierre? Yeah, oh yes. So they were active in here? Yeah, because I was uh, there with that night when they, when they, uh, they detected that, uh, that submarine. Yeah. Mm. Canada's wartime leadership grew alarmed and hatched a plan to capture and secure the Saint-Pierre transmitter to keep it out of Nazi hands. But when General Charles de Gaulle, who in exile had control of some of France's navy, heard about the Canadian plan, he ordered a loyal French admiral who had fled the Vichy regime to Halifax to invade Saint-Pierre before the Canadians did. Military historian Terry Reardon. The French Navy is moving towards Saint Pierre Miquelon. Yes. How big is it? Take us through it. One submarine and three corvettes, and they 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 uh, sail towards Saint Pierre. One gendarme is guarding the the quay at Saint Pierre. It's Christmas Eve. It's a cold, very cold. He runs out of coal for his fire, so he goes into town to get some more coal. When he's there, he said, it's silly me going back. There's obviously nothing going on. I'm going home to bed. Meanwhile, back at the quay, <laughs> these ships come in. It's 500 sailors come off, off the ships, go into town. They arrest the Bornet. That's the governor? The governor. And so then they take over the town. I call it the 30-minute invasion. Blink and it's over. Yeah. But Eugene Teo, who was in Saint-Pierre that Christmas Eve, remembers the resentment of the invasion lasting much longer than that. So what was the mood like as you saw the French Free Army approaching the shores of Saint-Pierre? Everybody was happy <laughs> to see that. 
But the other survived the people were not told or not. So there was a bit of division. They said, oh yes. How long did it take for things to calm down? Oh, <laughs> many years. Many years, maybe 10, 10 years after there was still, uh, still some. <laughs> there was still animosity about that day? Yeah. About what had happened? Yeah. People didn't like the fact that they'd been invaded? No, no, no. Even though it was the Free French? Free French, you know, I didn't like. Mm. How do you remember feeling? Mm -hmm. How did you oh, feel? Oh, yeah, happy, yes. I forgot. De Gaulle's invasion of Saint-Pierre was front page news that week in the war. A New York Times reporter had jumped aboard in Halifax and he wrote, the bloodless investiture of these surprised islands by four little warships was accomplished with a display of style and manners. The invasion of Saint-Pierre is barely an asterisk in the history books, but it prevented this highly strategic port and radio tower from falling into Nazi hands and maybe even prevented World War II from reaching the shores of North America. That wartime invasion is pretty much ancient history to today's young people in Saint-Pierre, but it's their generation who may pose the next threat to the future of the islands. Graduating students like Chloe Beaupartui, who must pursue their future away. She's working at a bed and breakfast to save money for university in Montreal, where she'll be studying engineering. It won't be her first time in Canada. Her mother has roots there. Her best friend is a lifeguard at the only beach near town. Marie Comier is heading to Rimouski to study marine biology. A lot of the students are finding that uh, the school system in France isn't what they'd expect it to be. So will Canada, do you think, feel more like home than France might have? Well, for me, it will be because I've spent a lot of time in Canada and I've always considered it home. Why do you think more young people are choosing to go to university in Canada? Um, some people uh, just think they are more Canadian, Canadian um, than French, but uh, the Canada, uh, we, we go a lot uh, to Canada, so they know uh, they will be uh, good uh, in Canada. So if more and more young people, um, because of the economy and because of the opportunity, mm -hmm. don't return to saint pierre miquelon what does that mean for the future of the islands? There's always going to be people that are coming back here, that's for sure. It's just people that are specializing in these careers that have no future here that are not coming back. The leadership of the islands is keenly aware it is facing a demographic crisis as fewer young people can see a future here. The islands don't even have high-speed cell service, and coverage is limited. Stéphane Lenormand is the territorial president of saint pierre miquelon a place where more than half of the people's salaries are subsidized government jobs, paid for by French and European taxpayers. How does saint pierre miquelon reinvent itself? So we hope to develop the tourism industry but also the digital. Therefore, the first thing we did was build two ferries, and a few days ago, we completed an underwater cable link, which will spur our economic development. Two brand new big ferries cross to Fortune Newfoundland several times a day, and for the first time, will allow cars and trucks to make the crossing. That's potentially a huge boost to Saint Pierre's economy. But there's a problem, because the Canadian side of the wharf has no facility to get those vehicles on or off, which means that for now, anyway, these new ferries are crossing without any vehicles at all. How frustrated are you that this hasn't happened yet on the Canadian side? Of course, I'm frustrated, it's clear. But it's a long-term project. I think that in the past two years, we have diversified and improved our tourism promotions. When does it need to be finished? I must find a solution by the end of 2018. So once again, Saint Pierre's future seems more in Canada's hands than France's, as it's been for most of the past century. 
But on this day, with France's World Cup game coming down to its final seconds, the people of Saint-Pierre and Miquelon are wearing their heritage with pride. An ocean apart from Paris, where the Champs-Élysées is filling with revelers, this tiny last outpost of France in North America is also jubilant. A tough people who have endured hardship and isolation for generations, now celebrating not only a World Cup win, but their unique and centuries-long link to the proud heart of France. And there is one other way that Saint-Pierre and Miquelon are preserving their historic link to France. This summer, for the first time, there were direct flights from Paris to Saint-Pierre every week. We'll be right back.